the community here today who vehemently, adamantly, fiercely, and unapologetically fought uh, to get rid of this blatantly racist gang injunctions uh, that caused a lot of harms in our communities. Uh, these uh, gang injunctions targeted exclusively black and brown men. Uh, they targeted our neighborhoods, um, Bayview Hunters Point, uh, Mission, Western Edition. Um, so what we uh, are here is not just to say that we are here celebrating this victory, uh, but we are here to say that as a community we will continue. We will continue to uh, call out these racist uh, policies, these blatantly racist uh, um, uh, injunctions like um, laws that are in place. Uh, one thing that is certainly uh, we are very concerned about is this very secretive San Francisco Police Department database, gang database. Uh, other databases, audits have found, uh, Cal Gang being one, uh, that kids as young as uh, 9, 12 years old were being placed on that uh, database, labeled as gang members. Uh, Chicago recently did one as well, which similarly found that uh, it was almost exclusively targeting black and brown uh, uh, individuals. Again, uh, small children were placed on that. New York City also did one. Uh, San Francisco has one. Uh, and that gang database, so far no one's been able to see, no one's been able to tell us what's in it. Uh, one of our coalition members uh, actually uh, uh, did a public records request requesting that uh, they, at San Francisco Police Department confirm whether or not she's on that gang database. Um, and San Francisco Police Department responded saying that uh, they can neither confirm or deny. Uh, now this is unconscionable, this is egregious, this is, we, we should not be having this in a city. Uh, it's a bit hypocritical for a city to say that they are progressive and they're anti-Trump and they're against uh, the xenophobic uh, racist rhetoric and at the same time uh, to allow this to happen. Uh, so I uh, am going to uh, introduce a, a good friend, a colleague, a fierce warrior uh, to tell us a bit more about what happened in his experience here in the Western Edition, a uh, coalition member and from Brothers for Change, uh, Eris. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, good morning, thank you all for coming. Uh, I stand here as a representative of Brothers for Change. Uh, what we did was we created a community action team to define the process of getting these members off the list. Uh, when you go to jail, you do your time, there's a parole date, there's a, promotion, a probation date in which you get off probation, you get off parole. The city attorney created a gang injunction and where these names would never get off the list. So we fought with the city attorney's office to find a way for them to opt out of this criminal list. The other thing that we found out through this historical gang injunction that even young men that were murdered stayed on the list to this day, he's going to end the gang judge, but names are still on that list. Families are still dealing with their grief of their children being on this list. They targeted young men from three different sites in the West Tradition, and we're right here standing on Eddy Street, where the three different uh, organized, I guess, gangs, they call them, created. It was King Garvey, KOP, you had Chopper City, Robert Pitts, Plaza East, and you know, so you had these three different organizations and what they call criminal gangs. But we all know how gangs work. This was not a criminal gang where they enhanced each other to prosper the neighborhood. These young men grew up in the complex, grew up with each other, and hung out with each other. And the only thing that didn't make sense was you called this a gang injunction. And you say criminal things that they can't do, which is against the law anyway. But you only make it to where it's, I can't, I can't carry a gun or sell dope on this property, but I can go across the street and carry a pistol and sell dope. Yeah. So the criminal acts of the gang injunction is a criminal act for all of us. Right, right. We can't do that anywhere. <laughs> so why target these young men and tell them what they can't do it, man, but they can do it across the street? So through this process, we worked with the, the lawyers for committee civil rights and community members. We worked with families that actually had their sons on this gang injunction. We worked with community members, advocates. That's all we do here. And that's what we've done. And I'm going to introduce you to a couple of those people. I'm going to start off with Sonia, who um, 
I want to say Jamal was one of our leading advocates to understand how this young man got on this list. This young man was looking to become a, uh, a physician. This young man was taking classes at City College. He was enrolled in the nursing program. The young man was on this list and got murdered by taking his nephew to get his phone bill paid. He got murdered because he was on this list saying that he was a gang member. So a rival gang member killed him, but he wasn't a gang member. This man was in a nursing school and just so happened to take his nephew to get his phone bill paid and got murdered. That's what this gang injunction did. So, you know, so he was the and uh, the whole thing is, to, to my to, to my thoughts, is control. And um, my son is it was one that wasn't going to be controlled. So by by unrighteously being on that list, my, that's why my son fell back. And, and to God's will, Eris came along, and that's that was all there. And that's how it went on and on and on to fight it. Of course, dealing with you know gang injunction, you had to deal with police. Yes. And we had road police actually invited, we invited these cops in the neighborhood, and it turns out that they were creating yes. this database to put people on the gang injunction. These road cops, yes. these narcotic officers, gang and task force, whatever you want to call them, you know, we had a community member, you know, an advocate in the community that's still here that fought them and understood the process of what community policing looked like. And he actually became the Western Edition uh, director of the community policing in the Western Edition, uh, and which now is the, uh, the president of where one of the gang and the sites is, is Marlon King Marcus Garvey. So he's the president of the complex board now, Daniel Landry. Yeah, so yeah, thank you, Eris. And Again, just to be clear and reiterate that this gang injunction from the city was misguided. It was uh, politics uh, at its best. And still to this day, the horror of the gang injunction has impacted families here in San Francisco and abroad. A lot of people don't know that Mario Woods was on the gang injunction list. A lot of people don't know that in early 2000, I guess three or four, that the chief actually told us directly when we had this community police relations board that the, the gang task force answers to no one. When you look at the facts, and when you look at how people was impacted and lost, and families was destroyed and divided by the gang injunction list, we all can agree that this city have let down the people. And when it comes to politics, one may wonder why a city that everybody claims to be Democrats seems to pass policies that is against the poor, that is against the black, that is against the brown. We want to see San Francisco recognize and acknowledge the natives and the people on the ground who have built this city into this wonderful city that everyone talks about. But this is very difficult when we see policies coming out of City Hall that's being pushed by our city attorney that we know doesn't work. So I stand here along with you as one of those who fought the gang injunction then, and now the only celebration is kind of bittersweet because we know the people have suffered in this 10 to 12 years, although the city is talking about ending the gang injunction now. And just on another note, speaking of community police, and like uh, Pastor Harris was speaking on, hey, we wanted to sit down with the police. We thought it was wise to sit down with them before they have to uh, run after you, stop you in the streets. It's better to have a conversation and look at each other and humanize each other. Because oftentimes, the people don't know the police reality and they definitely don't know our reality. 
So we told the captains, the lieutenants, the chief, you know, we want to meet your family. We want to know where you live at, because you know where we live at. And it's not right that you come here to San Francisco, because at that time, I believe 70 something percent of the uh, officers out of the 2,000 sworn officers in San Francisco stayed outside of the city. That's bad policy. So a lot of this gang injunction was motivated by clearing out areas so they could bring in developers, which continues to uh, hurt the city when it deals with the prices of market rate. It's all about the money. And now we stand here in 2019 and we have to look back and we have to be very critical of policy coming out of City Hall. And we have to challenge our mayor, challenge our supervisors, challenge our other uh, 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 officials that to never let this happen again. Um, thank you. And, uh, and thank all of you for putting together this uh, press conference and keeping the game of Johnson in the, in the forefront so people can be conscious of what happened so we can move forward. Yeah, um, add on to that about my son. Um, actually, my son was um, uh, the, um, the highest in his class. He was going to be an um, extra technician. And he was also a tutor. He created uh, study groups. And that's how, you know, he wanted his life to be. He didn't want to have a life like what those people tried to make it be. Thank you. And just to speak on, actually, Jamal, at this stance, we, uh, understood that the gang injunctions migrated through Southern California. So we took a road trip down to Southern California. Uh, we rented a van and went about 10 feet down there and uh, been to some spots. And what we did was we met up with uh, another one of our fierce leaders that actually got a whole university involved uh, from this industry that we got the coffee shop. Uh, Professor Nikki Jones was at you see Santa Barbara at the time, uh, she got involved with us and she took the database and all the stuff that she knew that we didn't know and put it in, you know, in professor's language. Um, and we took the trip down there to Santa Barbara and we brought Jamal down there with us and uh, one of the things that we tried to do was try to sneak him in the back door and get him in the road, you know. <laughs> Don't even come back home. Just, just, just stay out here, get in road. But I'll let Nikki Jones come up and talk. So, um, it is an honor to be here, and I have a lot of emotions being here. I was here when the gang injunction first came down and saw Brothers for Change. When it came to everybody in the neighborhood, they were the one organization that was stepping up to be side by side with the young people who were named on the injunction. And so often what happens is the neighborhood is encouraged to turn against those young people, the young people who are most vulnerable to violence, both at the hands of their peers and by the hands of, of the police through aggressive policing. Uh, and so they stood side by side, by side uh, with that group of young people uh, in the neighborhood. And so to be here now, knowing how hard they fought, but also knowing what has been lost. Uh, and I stand here with Sonia, um, feeling your grief still and knowing your son, so grateful to you for your son, who was a bright light and is someone that I carry with me now into the classroom, someone I'll never forget. Uh, and, to, and, and, and to know that this city could have done better when it came to serving your son and to serving black people and, and, and black and brown communities in this city uh, for decades. From the moment that black people have arrived in San Francisco, the city has treated them as a problem a problem and the solution has, has most often been law enforcement, patterns of exclusion, alienation. Uh, and so to me, this is a victory. It's also it's a, a symbolic victory that you can get a coalition, diverse coalition of people to work together as allies, not turned against one another, but as allies, you know, pushing back uh, and saying we want something else for our communities, we want something else uh, for the young people in our communities. And I will say, sitting in this sea of gentrification, one of the things that I, I, I admired, uh, uh, the folks that I had the honor of meeting during my time and I lived in the neighborhood and was doing work in the neighborhood, was how much they fought for this neighborhood, and how much they loved this neighborhood. 
And that's a story that doesn't, that doesn't get told uh, often enough. And so I see this as a manifestation of that love uh, for your neighborhood, for black people in the city, for brown communities in the city, for those who are most alienated and those who are most vulnerable. And that's an example for the rest of the city when it comes to thinking about in the next decade, are you going to stop for good this war against young people that started in the 80s and 90s? Are we gonna put a stop to that war and lift young people up? Or are we gonna do that? So it's an honor to be here, to be standing shoulder to shoulder with you once again. Uh, and I'm, I'm here uh, you know, as I can be useful. As I said way back then, if I can be useful, and if I can help in some way, I'm here. Well, you know, uh, the impact, of course, is always, uh, you know, great. But when you have people that come together that cross paths, you know, and uh, can work together in different ways. As I said, then, uh, we create the whole, try to create a whole opt-out place uh, where they can get off the list, whereas, um, you have a re-entry council member, Jose, which actually took it to another level and said, forget about them, let's get off the list. Let's get rid of the whole thing. <laughs> you know, and to sit on the re-entry council where you're sitting with members of formerly incarcerated and city government and to take on that task, knowing that you're disappointed and they can get rid of you at any time. That's not an easy task, to sit there amongst all those people and take on that task. So I want to congratulate you the whole thing and taking that leadership and stepping out there because you didn't have to do it uh, on that level. You know, of being on that board, it's almost like giving like it's a, it's a cool thing to do to sit on that re-entry council, you know. But you actually use the council for what it means as far as re-entry. So we want to thank you and appreciate you uh, and the organization that you created, you know, the coalition. And as you said before, it's not the end. So what is the next steps and what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the so next step is, uh, again, it's not the end. And I think folks spoke about it is, uh, you know, that we still have this, uh, pervasive attack on our communities you know it, it, it hasn't stopped uh, and while we we got rid of this terrible awful horrible thing there's still more happening and they're still criminalizing us and they're still finding different ways right and so the next thing that we're going to take on is the gang database because again there's no oversight over that once so you know i think um daniel you you spoke you know when you met with the with the police and they told you gang task force does whatever they want you know they do whatever they want like police already you know very little accountability on their end but then you have this like other unit in the, within the police department that they're out here they're you you know wherever they want they can do whatever they want and they can put you on a list a different list a, a database and nobody seen it nobody seen it except for them um so the next thing is we're going to do is we're calling uh for an audit of the gang database uh and if they got nothing to hide then show it right so that's the next step Totally you know, I actually would be remorse if I didn't invite this brother to speak because if the police stopped any one of us in that criminal activity that they were doing, anything that had been around us young folks hanging out in King Garvey, it was his mother that created her database on the cops. She created her cop database, took down badge numbers and everything. Every time something happened, you know, she took the initiative to step out, and she didn't have to do that. But she realized as a mother, all of us were her children out there, and she wanted to protect us. So, although he's in the Western Edition, he's actually working with those young folks that might be on this list in the baby on this point. Mr. Quincy Collins, when you say any words? <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am a senior case manager with Reentry over at um, Young Community Developers. I work with a lot of young men and young women that's trying to change their life. And yes, the gang task force is something 
they do put a lot of that on our kids. And some of our kids don't even have these kind of crimes. They just put them on there just so they can harass them. You know, and they see them hanging out, walking down the street, they automatically just harass them. And I feel it's all unfair to these young people that really do not do half the crimes that they are put into injustice. So yes, we do need to get rid of it. And all these dirty cops that's out there just doing a lot of this dirty work. Yeah. Thank you. When they did the gang injunction, and you guys just sparked my mind about a database, they had a packet that was made this thick that they slammed on certain people's porches. It had all of the people that they claimed was gang members in the Western Edition, their addresses, some of their relatives. They had this, this um, information for the public to see. And I was like, where did it come from? They was claiming they didn't know. But how could such information come out? My address was on it. Everybody who they touched, address was on it. Where they lived and everything. Even the whole community, they did. And that that was the first address that I saw. And someone, someone snuck it out, I don't know how, but it got out. Yeah. I saw everybody they had, they had to, every, every time they went to jail, what they did, and everything. Only these people that they claimed was the gang members. That was horrible. That was, that was scary right there. So, um, I don't know. I think one person may have that, that manifesto, and I'll, and I'll try to find it. But because it was it was a hard story. I don't want you to know where I live at. My mama and name all in it. It was like that. And database does exist. Trust the way. Yeah, that was that was actually, you know, since it was a civil injunction, a gang task force was going around the city and hand delivering it to people. And if you take it, you just got served. And they weren't telling them or giving them information. And of course, young people not knowing, you know, that, okay, should I take this? My name is on it. But yeah, there was a lot of personal information. You know what, Javon wouldn't was, take it. Well, see, he was a step ahead. Because most, most took it. And then, then the, you know, the city could claim that you've been served, you've been torn out. And if you missed the court date, then whatever, that's you didn't a, have your that's chance. A war. Yeah, exactly. Get you off the street. So that was the process, and they was just grouping all, like you said, all these things together under one particular area that was placed on the gang and dungeon. And it was unfair. It was just, it was just not it was dangerous. It was dangerous. And a lot of people have lost their lives since then behind. The and that, that'll have to be addressed because that was wrong. Woo! Well, I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, before we wrap up, we're going to make a real quick chance just to leave, you know, uh, so I think oftentimes the narrative is that law enforcement is the only people who can keep us safe. That they are somehow, uh, we relegate public safety to them and we know that's not true because we keep each other safe, okay? The, the safety looks like us, safety looks like community centers, Safety looks like you know schools, education. It looks like healthcare, clean water. That's what safety looks like. So th this is uh, uh, us pushing that narrative of what safety is. So when I say, who keeps us safe? You say we keep us safe. Who keeps us safe? 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 We keep us safe. All right, y'all. Cheers. Uh,